three chairwomen have already gone. Now the child sex abuse inquiry's top lawyer is suspended and tonight its second most senior lawyer resigns. What about justice for the abused? Good evening. It's a shambolic situation. Chair after chair resigns. Then the senior lawyer, who has helped guide proceedings thus far, is suspended. Now tonight, the second most senior lawyer confirms she's thrown in her resignation too. One of the biggest inquiries ever launched focused on widespread child abuse across England and Wales down the ages. Is it just too complex and wide-ranging to handle? Are the victims abused as children ever to find justice? When they had the investigation into Lambeth many years ago, when that failed, people committed suicide. This is how serious this is. Also on tonight's programme, we reveal the terrible plight of the 75,000 desperate people trapped on Syria's border with Jordan. With food and water scarce and no aid workers allowed, people are dying here. Why won't Jordan let them in? What will Brexit mean for British Steel? As the International Trade Secretary said leaving the EU presented a golden opportunity to demolish protectionism, we're in Scunthorpe seeing what the industry there makes of hard or soft Brexit. And the senior Labour member who questioned the definition of anti-Semitism and claimed some Jews were chief financiers of the sugar and slave trades, says she's... but tells us she won't be quitting as vice chair of the Momentum campaign. I actually do think that whoever leaked this story in the way they did from a training event had malicious intent in their mind. And we are in Colorado tonight, once a Republican stronghold which swung to the Democrats under Obama, now in the balance. But many are sick of the election campaign and lose themselves in the state's legal provision of marijuana. It's just the only time you can get away. Is it, if you have to smoke this to do it, please do. Or that's what we're here for is to help you calm down. Its most senior lawyer has been suspended. Hours later, news that another leading counsel had resigned. All this at the inquiry set up to get to the truth of widespread child abuse allegations across the country's public institutions. An inquiry which has already lost three chairpersons. Victims say it's devastating. So what does this mean for the future of this multi-million pound, two-year-long investigation? Here's our senior Home Affairs correspondent, Simon Israel. Britain's largest ever public inquiry has yet again lurched into crisis. Its chief lawyer, Ben Abbasson QC, is now suspended, under investigation for what and for how long has not been disclosed, least of all, apparently, to him. Some survivors' groups describe it as a catastrophe. It's devastating. And I will say this, when they had the investigation into Lambeth many years ago, when that failed, people committed suicide. This is how serious this is. And I, I just don't get that people are taking this seriously enough, that you're leading people to believe they're going to get justice. They're going back through their backstory, reliving the nightmares again, just to watch this farce. Awful. Ben Emerson's been described as a Goliath in the area of human rights. His CV certainly reflects that. A United Nations Special Rapporteur on Counterterrorism, a British judge at the International Criminal Court. He defeated the UK government over detention without trial and defeated the MOD over discrimination against homosexuals in the armed forces. So will the child abuse inquiry lose teeth if his suspension becomes dismissal? I just hope that if, God forbid, that is to happen, that a replacement is found. This inquiry is by no means just about one person or a handful of people. It's a massive undertaking. This evening, things got even worse when it emerged that another of the inquiry's lawyers, Elizabeth Prochaska, a colleague of Mr Emerson's, had quit. And amid this turmoil, an inquiry statement attempted to reassure all those it was set up to help. We are aware that recent events are unsettling, particularly for victims and survivors of child sexual abuse and all those who are engaged with the inquiry's work. It has been said that the inquiry is in crisis. This is simply not the case. After two years, the inquiry has yet to hear evidence in any of its 13 separate investigations into failing institutions, ranging from churches to councils to government itself. In that time, though, it's lost three chairwomen 
and now possibly its most senior lawyer. But the one thing that has remained are the inquiry's ambitious terms of reference. When those terms of reference were set, they were agreed with victims and survivors. And it's victims and survivors who are at the heart of this inquiry. For too many years, too many people have been raising their voice, uh, at saying what has happened to them, and people have not been listening. The inquiry is at pains to point out that this latest friction is not about its scope, but about the conduct of its chief lawyer. However, yet again, the central issue remains as to just what this multi-million pound independent inquiry is supposed to be about and whether it can really deliver justice to so many victims and so many survivors going back so many years. Channel 4 News understands that the current chair, Professor Alexis J, is nearing the end of a review that will determine the future of this beleaguered inquiry. Simon Israel and victims whose cases are being investigated by the Independent Inquiry into Sexual Abuse faced another blow today. With more on that, Ed Hauker is with me. He's been looking into the events at the Knollview Residential School in Rochdale for some time. Ed. Well, so I've spoken to pupils from the Knollview Residential School today and they're incredibly angry because Greater Manchester Police have decided to end their investigation looking into abuse allegations at the school. You may remember Norview School was founded by Cyril Smith and allegations have swirled that pupils there were abused in the 70s, 80s and 90s. Well, tonight and today, the CPS and Greater Manchester Police will bring charges against just one uh, man. In the meantime, pupils feel incredibly upset about that and their only hope, really, is that the independent inquiry into sexual abuse will examine their uh, claims. That's the good news. But after today's news, I suppose it's the bad news as well. Cyril Smith looms large over Rochdale again tonight. After his death, Greater Manchester Police acknowledged the overwhelming evidence that the local MP had sexually and physically abused young boys and began investigating offences committed at Knoll View, a residential school for vulnerable boys, that he was allowed to found. But the MP was not the only person alleged to have abused boys at the school. Internal council reports from the 1990s state that boys as young as eight were sexually active and that on one night, another alleged abuser gained access to the school. The staff were not there and he abused boys on the premises. Phil Taylor, a health worker, filed the first report, alarmed that boys were prostituting themselves in the town centre. People were coming away from as far away as Yorkshire, Sheffield. They knew about what was going on, abusing these boys. And it, it was just continuing. It wasn't being stopped. Today, Greater Manchester Police said they were dropping their investigation into Norview after referring allegations involving 27 suspects to the CPS. They say there is insufficient evidence to prosecute all but one man. Other alleged abusers are dead. A social worker at Knollview says the pupils were failed, first by the school and again by police. Martin Deegan says it's now up to them to find justice. If police inquiries can no longer continue wasting public money, then the individuals who've got cases with Slater and Gordon and other people, uh, uh, solicitors in Manchester and thereabouts, might now be able to take their cases to the High Court and be heard, and then this documentation will come out, and then the truth will come out, and then they, maybe, just maybe, there'll be some justice for, for the lads that are still alive, because we remember, a number are dead. Well, we're joined now from Edinburgh by Ian McFadden. He suffered abuse whilst a student at Caldicott School in Buckinghamshire and is a participant in this inquiry. And Labour MP Chukramuna, a member of the Home Affairs Select Committee, who is also standing to be the committee's next chair. Uh, Ian McFadden, what's your reaction to what's happened today? It must feel like another hammer blow. Well, John, I'm personally, I'm, I'm really very angry. Um, I hear people who supposedly advocate for survivors saying that this is a hiccup. This, this is not a hiccup. This is, this is a meltdown, um, and it's wholly unacceptable. You, you know, the, the inquiry may well be putting out press releases that, that, that they're not in crisis, but I can assure you, with the survivors that I've spoken to, they're in crisis with what's going on today. Well, now, has your contact with this committee made any sense? Have you felt that it had a potential to deliver? 
Well, I, I'm, I'm awaiting for my strand uh, within, within the inquiry to, to be put forward so I can apply for core participant status. Um, but, uh, you know, at this rate, the way we're going forward, I may well be drawing my pension quicker than I actually get uh, core participant status. Your very use of the phrase, I'm waiting for the strand, suggests it's an immensely complicated process even to line up what they're going to do. It may well be, John, but we, none of this is rocket science. If we look towards Australia, um, Australia ha has an inquiry which is being regarded as really highly successful, and it's as complex and complicated as our inquiry. Um, you know, if, if it needs to be broken down into smaller pieces, so be it. But the terms of references currently are non-negotiable. Well, Chukaramuna, that's really where you come in, because your committee is going to question the new chair of the uh, Committee of Inquiry. Um, and, and I'm wondering, do, do you feel the whole thing needs reconfiguring, or what? I think there does need to be some reconfiguring. My principal interest in this is actually that many of the survivors from the Shirley Oates Survivors Group in your package are constituents of mine. So I've been following this now for the last couple of years. But for the inquiry to say, well, look, there isn't a crisis, it's not credible to suggest that this is a properly functioning inquiry. It's dysfunctional. When you lose three chairs, you're now on to your fourth. You lose your lead counsel. Well, he has been suspended. He was told he was suspended through learning of it by the internet. It doesn't seem he was told. You lose the second most senior lawyer, Elizabeth Prochaska, as well. It might not be a crisis, but it's incredibly dysfunctional. And I think that these short statements we've seen on the inquiry's website are not enough. Um, Alexis Jay, the professor who is leading the inquiry, she is due to be giving evidence to the Home Affairs Select Committee in the middle of October. But frankly, I think we need a much fuller statement from her as to what is going to happen with the lead counsel of the inquiry. Obviously, they're investigating that, but how long is he going to be suspended for? How does it affect the inquiry's work? Will the second lead counsel, Elizabeth Prochaska, who, by the way, actually it appears resigned effective from the 15th of September, we've only just learnt about it now, is somebody going to replace her? And then in terms of the overall structure, one of the things that Professor Jay's predecessor, Lewell Goddard, referred to was just the sheer, the sheer size of it. And I think this is one of the reasons why perhaps a proper federal structure for the inquiry needs to be instituted, where we currently have 13 different investigations which are the subject of the inquiry. Well, why not turn those into 13 mini-inquiries with a proper named head who can lead for that part of the country that it refers to? So, for example, the one that's dealing with Lambeth, you could have a head of the inquiry for Lambeth, and then Professor Jay could lead coming up with the overall national recommendations and conclusions of the inquiry. That might m help it make it a bit more manageable, and perhaps that's what she's looking into in her review. But do you sense that these resignations and the suspension may be exactly about that, about how they go forward, how they structure going forward? And do you have a view on whether, for example, Mr Emerson should indeed be desuspended? Well, I, I th I'm not sure it would be appropriate for me to, contact, uh, to comment on that without knowing exactly why he has been suspended. They deny, by the way, John, that the reason that he has left... Well, he hasn't left, of course. The reason he's been suspended is because he disagrees with the whole way that the inquiry is being run. Um, but, I mean, this investigation needs to happen very quickly. I mean, of course, for him, he is a deputy High Court judge. If he's not seen as being fit conducting the inquiry, then for him personally, that has implications, which is why he has instructed lawyers to no. act on his behalf, it would seem, in respect of his suspension. Well, Ian McFadden, what does it feel like, as a survivor, um, simply to have this extraordinary swirl going on at the top and really absolutely nothing changing your life in the bottom? Can I be wholly honest with you, John? I, I've been dealing with this inquiry um, for the last two and a half years. It, it has consumed my life. There are a few people who I have met along the way. Ben Emerson is one of them. Um, he is a man who has all the skill set to be doing the job that he's been employed to do. Um, people ask me 
Is this, is this the establishment trying to undermine um, the credibility or, or the ability for this inquiry to step forward? Two years ago, I would have said that there were conspiracy theorists who came up with this. Now, I'm beginning to doubt. You know, at, at what stage is this an independent inquiry? As far as I can understand, the Secretariat and the head of the Secretariat were, were ex um, ex civil servants from the Home Office. They were, one of them was an employee for, from Theresa May's office. You know, at what stage are we going to have an inquiry that's fit for survivors' purpose and that isn't going to keep re traumatizing people who were terribly abused in their childhood? Ian McFadden, thank you very much indeed. And I'm sorry to put you through that, but thank you very much. And Chukra Muna, thank you very much indeed. We'll look to see what your committee comes up with next week. Cathy. Thanks, John. Now, parents living around Oxford have been warned not to let their children walk alone after a teenage girl was abducted and raped on her way to school. The 14-year-old was walking down a busy road at half past eight in the morning when two men managed to get her into their car and assaulted her. Police are also investigating a nearby attack on a 19-year-old girl at the weekend. Fatima Manji is there. Fatima, a really frightening story, this. Yes, Cathy, this is a busy junction in Oxford and it was a busy time of morning, just around half past eight, which is perhaps one of the reasons why it is such a shocking incident. What we know is a 14-year-old girl in her school uniform was walking to school. She was abducted by two men who she does not know, had never met before, who pulled her into a car, raped her and then subjected her to a four-hour ordeal because she was found uh, just up, about a mile up the road at about uh, noon after she had been knocking on neighbours' doors desperately trying to get help. And as you can imagine, she was pretty traumatised. This is what police had to say about her condition. Well, uh, as you will appreciate, she's extremely traumatised, extremely upset. Um, she's receiving the help that uh, we, we, we are offering her in terms of that. And at the same time, we are doing that very important job of trying to to tease that information out of her so that we can uh, use that as part of our investigation and also to make those appeals that I'm making today. Now, that young girl is in the, is in the care of uh, special officers who are helping her cope with what's happened. Um, what we know is that uh, about these two men is that they are two white men. There's not much of a description apart from that. That they were travelling in a silver car, a hatchback, a small one, possibly a VW. One of the things that police are asking for is anyone who is passing by the area who might have a helmet cam or a dash cam because they might have spotted something. If that's you, you should come forward to police and, and present um, that footage. One thing to say, though, is when we talk about an abduction, this wasn't a violent snatching. Police say it might have looked like the girl was actually just being hugged, something fairly innocent, when she was actually being pulled into the car. Of course, we now know that it was um, nothing like that and turned out to be really quite a traumatic attack. And in the meantime, uh, parents are being urged not to let children walk alone and anyone who was in the area should come forward with evidence. Cathy. Fatima, thanks very much. Police say they've recovered two bodies from water after they were spotted on a tidal mud bank in Norfolk. The bodies of a man and a woman, both believed to be aged between 40 and 50 years old, were found at Braden Water in Great Yarmouth after a bird watch alerted police. It's not yet known how the pair died. The Syrian government has denied bombing civilians as its ally Russia vowed to carry on targeting rebel-held areas in Aleppo. Syria's UN envoy Al Jafari laughed off the accusations, instead blaming terrorists for the civilian deaths. Syria's strong denial followed a warning from the United States Secretary of State, John Kerry, who said that given the latest violence, America was on the verge of stopping talks with Russia altogether over Syria. And I think that the bombing of Aleppo right now is inexcusable. It's beyond any, uh, beyond the pale of any notion of uh, strategic or otherwise. It's, 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 it's indiscriminate. It is, they took out a hospital last night. Uh, I think 400 civilians have been killed in the last eight days. A hundred of them are children. Uh, and uh, we've made it crystal clear to them that under those kinds of circumstances, it is not possible to be uh, cooperating and we need to see a change. And at the same time, tens of thousands of Syrian refugees are stranded in a no-man's land on the Jordan-Syrian border. Aid workers believe more than 75,000 people are trapped in the desert with very little food and water. Aid agencies haven't been able to get through, and Jordan won't let the refugees cross out of Syria. 
The Jordanian government tells Channel 4 News it's working on a plan to set up aid distribution points, but cannot say yet when that will happen. The makeshift camp is in Rukban, a desert area known as the Berm after the large sand wall which divides the countries. This program has obtained footage filmed by refugees showing the desperate conditions, as Diana Magne now reports. These piles of stones the children weave through, lugging precious and scarce water are graves. A makeshift burial ground in a bare patch of desert, a rare glimpse of the no man's land sandwiched between Syria and the border crossings of Rukban and Hadalat in northeastern Jordan. Home to a forlorn but growing collection of tents battered by the desert wind, which shelter thousands of would-be refugees fleeing the chaos in Syria, but who Jordan won't let in. There's no shade here, there's no vegetation, there's nothing to eat. But there is desperate need. You can see from these satellite images how much the camp has grown since last December. Syrian refugees fleeing Deir Azur, Raqqa and the area around Palmyra. There are now around 75,000 trapped in what's known as the Berm, a man-made defensive ridge of sand along the border designed to keep tanks and people out and more arrive in from Syria each day. But there's no way in for aid workers or journalists. We were sent these videos by a Syrian refugee inside the camp. This lady tells him she arrived eight months ago. There used to be aid coming in, at least. This was last May, when the humanitarian agencies still had access. They could bring in water for tens of thousands of thirsty mouths. Everything that a people with nothing in a city built on dust might need. And people could still pass through the border. Even though they were tightly screened, there were still buses laid on to take people through to add to the 650,000 Syrian refugees already inside Jordan. Then in June, a suicide car bomb killed six Jordanian border guards near the camp at Rukban. Already concerned at the proximity of ISIS, Jordan closed its northern border and shut down access to the camps. In August, the government granted the World Food Programme permission to make a one-off delivery, winched in via crane over the berm. But those supplies lasted just a month. This week, these two lost their son, 26-year-old Omar. They don't even know what had made him so ill. Then there's Fatima, who also died this week. She'd been sick for two years. A new and tiny grave made up for her in the sand. We um, know that there are 450 pregnant women there that we saw when we were there who don't have access to medical care. They haven't had any food since um, early August and the food drop ran out. So the amount of food that they were given ran out um, in early September. Um, it's a humanitarian emergency and, and it's not getting any better. And so is far away phone calls between UN aid agencies and Jordan's government to try and hammer out a solution to set up aid distribution points, which the government says may happen soon. The rhythm of daily life here goes on. <laughs> An inhospitable desert playground as the autumn nights set in. Diana McNay reporting there. Now, at least one person has been killed and more than 100 others injured after a commuter train crashed at one of New Jersey's busiest stations. Witnesses said the train ploughed up full speed during the morning rush hour through ticket barriers and straight into the station reception area in Hoboken, just across the Hudson River from New York City. 
Pictures on social media show extensive damage to the train carriages and station, with part of the building roof caved in, causing mayhem on one of the main commuter routes into Manhattan. The people in front of me were badly injured, and then we just heard people screaming in the first car that they were trapped, they couldn't get out, um, and the conductor managed to get us off of that same doorway. Um, one of the gentlemen lifted the, 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 the lever for us to get off, and once we got off, we noticed that people were stuck, and they had to come out through the windows. The police were trying to rescue them, and the conductor came off, and he was completely bloodied, and that's when we started to notice that there were more injuries. Um, now, it's not often you hear a politician talk of the glorious joy of free trade, but that was exactly the phrase used by the International Trade Secretary, Liam Fox, who's been urging the world to tear down the barriers of protectionism. But what about businesses which have been hoping for more protection, like British Steel, rescued from the floundering Tatar Empire? Its boss has told this programme that although they're back in profit, they want government action to help the industry. Here's our business correspondent, Helia Ebrahimi. In steel, the big cavalry has gone. That was today's verdict in Scunthorpe from the new boss of British Steel. After 100 days in business, the newly forged smaller company says it's already gone back into profit. But bubbling under the surface is a hardening frustration with the pace of government action. How much industry do you really want to have in your country? I'm not sure they ever answered that question. If you don't answer that question, you have no strategy. But 90 miles away in Manchester, the new trade minister was showcasing a different vision. My message today is a simple one. Free trade has, and will continue to, transform the world for the better. But hang on, many voters will feel that Brexit should mean more backing for British industry. But after a whistle-stop tour of six countries, Liam Fox has returned home in favour of open doors rather than Britain first. The terrible truth about protectionism is that while it might be a short-term vote winner, winner <clears throat> or temporarily prop up failing industries, it's always the consumer and often the poorest in society that will ultimately lose out. But that's not how they see it in Scunthorpe. As far as I'm concerned, I don't think the government has an industrial strategy. I don't think they honestly understand manufacturing in the slightest. I keep meeting with them, they keep promising me this and that, then they get back on the trains and they'll go back to London and forget all about us. Just yesterday, another former Tartar business was also being brought back to life, with a different statesman on hand to take the credit. But for the rest of Tartar's much larger Port Talbot rank and file, the future still hangs in the balance. In this industry, patience with politicians is running out. It's far too early to call a renaissance in steel, Output this year is due to be at its lowest level since the 1930s. And here in Scunthorpe, they say government support is vital. Theresa May will have to decide how much of her industrial strategy is about getting involved and how much is about free trade. I have not seen uh, a serious uh, result coming out of that. And especially, I have not seen any actions in that frame. The one action the government has taken is to give the go-ahead for the Hinkley Point nuclear reactor. Contracts were signed today with China, but it hasn't been easy. Handing the £18 billion deal to state-backed foreign businesses has sparked controversy. Now British Steel say it's up to the Prime Minister to prove this joined-up thinking by making sure it's businesses like them that get to deliver on these grand projects. Helia Ebrahimi at the Scunthorpe Steelworks, British Steelworks. Cathy. Thanks, John. Now, a leading Jeremy Corbyn supporter has provoked furious accusations of anti-Semitism over remarks she made at an anti-Semitism training event. Jackie Walker, who's vice chair of the left-wing Momentum Group, was heckled at a meeting on Monday after she apparently criticised Holocaust Memorial Day for not including non-Jewish genocide victims. Jackie Walker was secretly recorded making the remarks at the Labour Party conference this week. I was speaking for information and I still haven't heard a definition of anti-Semitism that I can work with. And in terms of Holocaust Day, I would also like to say, wouldn't it be wonderful if Holocaust Day was open to all people who've experienced Holocaust? 
It is. It is. It's for all genocides. And it's not the first time she's been accused of anti-Semitism. Back in May, she was suspended from the Labour Party after posting during a Facebook discussion that Jews were chief financiers of the sugar and slave trade. It's also emerged, she said, proportionately more gypsies were killed by the Nazis. She was readmitted to the party after an investigation, but Jewish groups are now demanding she be sacked as vice chair of Momentum. Well, earlier I spoke to Jackie Walker and I began by asking her what she meant when she said she hadn't found a definition of anti-Semitism that she could work with. Um, well, actually, it wasn't the first time the trainer had been asked that question. A number of other people had asked, what is the definition of anti-Semitism? So I just followed up that question because I was looking for what was the definition of anti-Semitism so that what is we your could actually definition? use so that we could... What is my definition? I would say um, racism against Jews or, or hatred against Jewish people. But I think... I'm not even sure if that's adequate. But why are you asking that question? I mean, surely it's pretty obvious what anti-Semitism is. Why did you feel the need to challenge what the definition was? I, I wasn't challenging it. I was. Uh, this, remember, this was a training event. And um, I don't know if you've ever been to training events about racism, but they will all be working towards a particular definition of the racism that they're talking about. Um, so I was asking, you know, what definition there was. There are, for example, some definitions of anti-Semitism that talk about... Um, anything that challenges um, Zionism as being anti-Semitic. So I wanted to be clear about what we were talking about. So in your view, anti-Zionism is OK, but anti-Semitism isn't, is that right? I think Zionism is a political ideology. And like any political ideology, some people we will be supportive of it and some people won't be supportive of it. I think that's a very different thing. But you would happily describe yourself as an anti-Zionist, if not an anti-Semite? Yeah. Well, I certainly wouldn't call myself an anti-Semite, as I am Jewish and my partner is Jewish. I mean, a lot of Jewish people might have a problem even with anti-Zionism, but let me just move on to something else you said, um, and I'll quote you again. In terms of Holocaust Day, wouldn't it be wonderful if Holocaust Day yes. was open to all people who experienced Holocaust? I mean, that's not just offensive, but it's also plain wrong, isn't it? Um, well, it depends, doesn't it? Because as far as I know, um, the um, Holocaust Memorial Day celebrates genocides that happened post the Nazis, doesn't it? Well, it, it, it commemorates and it, all sorts of genocides. No, no. I think if you look on their website, it says they commemorate you know, all sorts of genocides like Rwanda and Cambodia, but they're all genocides that happened post the Nazis. So when you put out your statement saying you were sorry if you caused offence, you actually thought what you were yeah. saying was factually correct? Why would I want to hurt people's feelings? Of course I'm sorry if any offence was given, but I actually do think that whoever leaked this story in the way they did from a training event had malicious intent in their mind. Well, you see, a lot of Jewish people are deeply offended uh, by the suggestion, the question that you placed over uh, Holocaust Day, because they see the Holocaust as such a distinct tragedy that it deserves a day yeah. to commemorate it. Do you, do you disagree with that? Of course. Of course. You know, uh, the Jewish Holocaust was a, an awful, extraordinary event. And Jews should have a day when they celebrate that. But there is also a confusion, isn't there? Because if, you know, as a person of mixed heritage, both African and Jewish, I felt, why is that cut-off point in the, in the 1940s? So if you've, if you've gone through the Cambodian uh, genocide, that is commemorated. But if you've gone through the African Holocaust, that's not. But in the past, you've also written on Facebook that the Holocaust, quote, is not the preserve of Jews and, quote, proportionately more gypsies were killed by the Nazis as a total of population. Do you stand by those comments? 
I uh, look. I don't stand by those comments in the way that you have actually said them in that way. I think what I know, as what everybody knows, is that the proportion of Romani people who died in the Holocaust was awful, and the, the, the number of other peoples who died in that Holocaust was also terrible, and they should also be commemorated. The problem is that you've said all these things in the past. You've also said that the Jews were the chief financiers of the sugar and slave trade. You've also said that the no, Jewish Holocaust doesn't no, no, allow no, no, Zionists no. to do what they want. You, let me just let me just finish the question. You've said no, all no. these things and the cumulative effect of this is that people then, particularly yeah. Jewish people, think that you are hostile yeah. to them, prejudiced against them. <sighs> what I said and I was talking about my family at a particular point of time, in the Caribbean, in a particular place. Many Jews, I said, at that particular point in time. A lot of prominent Jewish groups, anti-Semitism groups, feel very offended by what you've said yeah. and said that it proves that Labour's not safe for Jews and that you should resign. Yeah. Have you considered resigning? Uh, uh, and, uh, and what I would put to you is some other prominent Jewish groups of which I'm a member of think a very different thing and I think what we have to look at at times when we're talking about this subject particularly at the moment is the political differences that are underlying this as well. Jackie Walker thank you very much. Thank you. And in the last hour Channel 4 News has learned that members of Momentum Steering Committee are seeking to remove Jackie Walker as vice chair of the organisation will be meeting on Monday. And the General Secretary of the TSSA Union, Manuel Cortes, has tonight called on her to resign from the Labour Party. Now, the head of, North, of South Yorkshire Police has been told to resign due to erosion in confidence and trust in his leadership following the Hillsborough Inquiry report earlier this year. Chief Constable David Crompton, who has already been suspended by the police and crime commissioner, says he'll take legal action over the move, calling the decision fundamentally wrong. Another top police officer, the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, will be retiring seven months before his contract ends. Sir Bernard Hogan Howe has dismissed rumours that he was stepping down because he didn't think the new Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, would reappoint him. He also denied that the imminent publication of a report into the Met's handling of historic abuse cases had anything to do with his decision. There have been more allegations of corruption in English football today as part of the investigation that has already cost New England manager Sam Allardyce his job. This time, the focus was on championship team Barnsley, with assistant head coach Tommy Wright sacked this afternoon after appearing to take cash from undercover reporters posing as agents. It's just the latest development in a week that has tarnished the beautiful game, as Paul McNamara now reports. Well, listen, we really ought to give him some ready to get him started. The man you're looking at, the man who needs readies to get him started, is Tommy Wright, who was Barnsley assistant manager. And today this exchange cost him his job. You know what I like. His livelihood sacrificed for £5,000, the amount he reportedly took from undercover journalists in return for recommending players to buy. Tommy Wright denies any wrongdoing, but he's the second senior football figure scalped by scandal this week. The first was the England boss himself, Sam Allardyce. His resignation welcomed by some in the game. What we're talking about is people stealing money, effectively. That's what they do. Now, whether you're earning 50 grand a year or 50 grand a week, you're stealing money. So, I, you know, I don't, I don't know anybody that gets caught doing that you need to be removed from the game permanently. That's it. Good night. Strolling across the QPR training ground this morning, it all looked business as normal for manager Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank. He was filmed too, appearing to negotiate a large fee for flying to the Far East to give a talk. He's told the firm wants to recommend him players to sign, an arrangement in itself not against the rules. Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank strongly denies any wrongdoing and QPR say they have every confidence in him, although they have added that he'll be subject to a thorough internal investigation. But ugly clouds over the beautiful game now seem to stretch across the entire country. And questions aren't just being asked of the odd club, but of the governing body itself, the Football Association. MPs are calling for the FA to be brought before Parliament, an FA that has been highly critical of recent scandals at football's highest body, FIFA. The uh, 
FA was right to speak out about the need for FIFA reform, and FIFA still hasn't reformed, but also the FA has to get its own house in order too. The problems we're facing in this country are not unique. I think they are common to football around the world, but here we should be setting a standard and doing something about it. The FA, the Premier League and the English Football League have all said they will investigate substantive claims of corruption. The integrity of the game, they say, is of paramount importance. But more allegations are expected, including details of eight current or former as yet unnamed Premier League managers who reportedly also took bribes. Two jobs have already been lost to greed this week. They may not be the last. Paul McNamara reporting. Now, while Hillary Clinton seems to be enjoying a slight boost in support after Monday's presidential debate in New York, she's struggling to persuade young voters to rally behind her. In Colorado, which backed her rival Bernie Sanders in the Democratic primary, millennials are all still wrestling with how to cast their votes, as polls put Clinton neck and neck with Donald Trump. Our correspondent Kylie Morris joins us now from Boulder. Kylie? Well, John, Colorado has been called a tipping point state. There are nine electoral college votes here up for grabs. And in this election, which it seems will be won by the thinnest of margins, every single one of those votes counts. Now, um, as you mentioned, Bernie Sanders won the primary here. So there is a reservoir of support among a millenn millennials still for him. I think on the left, you can probably break the, the voters into three categories. There are those who will wholeheartedly and with joy in their hearts go and vote for Hillary Clinton. There are those who will vote for Hillary Clinton with reservations uh, but want to stop Donald Trump. And there are younger people who say, well, look, I feel no loyalty towards Hillary Clinton. Um, and so for that reason, I'm simply not going to vote for her. We'll vote for a third party candidate or a Green. If there are too many of those, that's a real problem. At the foot of the Rocky Mountains nestled in a wilderness idyll is the democratic safe haven of Boulder. The midweek farmer's market does a steady trade in organic produce and homemade goods. It's Hillary Clinton heartland, or at least it should be. Want a party? Then let's take care of this planet then, okay? Yeah. But not everyone's coming to the party. A young electorate that feels unrepresented by the two-party system and older voters looking with nostalgia at candidates past. Obama, he, he had a certain ability to get people excited. I think the fact that he was black was very exciting. Mm. The fact that she's a woman doesn't seem to be exciting. Mm. Go figure. But there are those who value the idea of electing America's first woman president. I definitely support her like wholeheartedly and I, I yeah. truly hope to God that she wins. <laughs> Loyal yeah. Democrats are worried that millennials aren't energized by Hillary in the same way as they were by Bernie Sanders. Yeah. Do you think that's a realistic concern? Uh, I think it was for a little bit, but, um, and I mean, this is totally based on my Facebook Absolutely. feed. Yeah. Like well, people who are one time like Bernie or bust are now like, all right, after watching that debate, I got to vote for Hillary Clinton. I was definitely one of those people. Uh, I watched the debate the other night and she did kind of really turn my corners. And you were Secretary of State. But do you remember a, a moment in the debate where you thought, yeah, actually, <laughs> now, now you've got my vote. That was good. Yeah, uh, there was a moment when Donald Trump commented on her look and her stamina. She doesn't have the look. She doesn't have the stamina. I said she doesn't have the stamina. As soon as he travels to 112 countries or even spends 11 hours testifying in front of uh, a congressional committee, he can talk to me about stamina. How she responded to that was very empowering. So it says, ask the rabbi. So I'm wondering, can I ask you anything? Who's going to win the presidential election, do you think? Now you have to ask the prophet, not the rabbi. <laughs> For many young voters, Bernie Sanders was the prophet, but on the stump with Hillary yesterday, he urged them to back her. This election is enormously important for the future of our country. It is imperative that we elect Hillary Clinton as our next president. It's, kind of like a, like it's all so stressful. In the weed dispensary on Pearl Street, they're doing their best to ease election-related anxiety. They come in here and they say, I just need something to just get away from it all. You know, just please, just, I, it's so big, it's everywhere, it's on TV, it's on social media, it's what your friends are probably talking about, it's just the only time you can get away. Is it, if you have to smoke this to do it, please do. Or that's what we're here for, is to help you calm down. 
The irrepressible Katie was a Bernie disciple, but she'll vote for a third party rather than Hillary. There are some Hillary supporters who would say vote for the third party will effectively help Trump. What would you say to that? I would say don't even care what other people are saying because your vote is for you in this country and it's really, it's, that's what the beauty of this country is. Inside the Boulder bubble, the pros and cons of Hillary are still up for discussion, but beyond, her opponent Donald Trump looms large on the horizon. She'll need a strong showing here to have any chance to win the state come November. So how does she turn it around, uh, Kylie? Well, yes, I think uh, th clearly speaking to people yesterday, the debate really mattered. You heard a couple of young people there saying, look, they saw her. They were suddenly persuaded where they hadn't been otherwise. I think also appearing on stage with Bernie Sanders is really very smart. Adopting some of Bernie Sanders' policies, as she has in her campaign, is also helping. Elizabeth Warren, Michelle Obama are now taking a much more visible role on her behalf as well. I think Michelle Obama spoke out yesterday and said any vote against uh, any vote for anyone other than Hillary Clinton is a vote for Donald Trump. So certainly people are gently feeling the pressure that they need to get behind Hillary Clinton. But as you heard from Katie, who works in the weed shop just down the road, she <laughs> reserves the right to vote for a third party. There is no loyalty towards Hillary Clinton from the 75 uh, million millennials who have a chance to cast their vote on the, on the 9th of November. They simply want uh, the chance to vote for a libertarian if they'd like or a Green Party candidate if they like, and they will do that. And Trump, what's he doing to boost his chances? Well, Trump is coming to Colorado on Monday. Uh, he is going to spend, we understand, two and a half million dollars on television advertising here in Colorado between now and election day. So he clearly thinks that this is his state to win, which is curious given that Ted Cruz, in fact, won Colorado uh, during the primary process. And this is the place where the Never Trump campaign actually began. He's not really the kind of candidate who would normally uh, find support among Republicans here in Colorado. It's a much more conservative, even evangelical uh, kind of state. So for that reason, he hasn't done well in the past, but he's turning that around. I get the sense that as we get closer to this election, with uh, Hillary Clinton looming for Republicans, while they may have had doubts about Donald Trump in the past, they're now feeling compelled to support him. Uh, we'll have more uh, detail on how that Trump campaign is going. We're heading to Colorado Springs uh, and we'll have a report from there tomorrow. But for now, that's all from us and back to you. Kylie Morris in Colorado. After the break, we meet the composer Steve Reich, the pioneer of minimal music, turns 80 next week. And there are 400 performances planned across the world to celebrate. <laughs> Welcome back. Now, he pioneered minimal music in the 1960s. His music draws inspiration from sources as eclectic as West African drumming and Balinese gamelan. The American composer Steve Reich has influenced generations of pop, jazz and classical musicians ever since, including John Adams and Brian Eno. So to celebrate his 80th birthday, 400 performances will be played in over 20 countries, including the Grammy Award winning Different Trains, which will be played at Edge Hill Station in Liverpool tonight. <laughs> A piece of music which needs no instruments, just the human body. That's how Steve Reich, seen on the right here, described his clapping music, one of many works where the innovative use of rhythm has earned him the accolade America's Greatest Living Composer. Tonight he'll celebrate his 80th birthday with his work Different Trains played at a railway station in Liverpool. The piece alludes to journeys he made between New York and L.A. as a child and his painful awareness that had he lived in Europe, he could well have been transported to the Nazi concentration camps. Played by a string quartet, it features haunting snatches of dialogue from Holocaust survivors. Earlier this week, I went to meet him at the Yamaha Piano Hall. Different Trains is being performed in Liverpool as right. a sort of birthday event for you. Um, you're a great believer, aren't you, in taking classical music out of the concert hall. Tell me why. Chuck Berry said, any old way you use it. 
In other words, there's another slang word we have in the trade is called the music has legs. Um, one great example, when I was 16 years old, or my mother felt you know every young man, every American should go to Europe for finishing. And uh, I used the occasion to go down to Venice to hear the world premiere of a piece by Stravinsky who I loved. And before they played Stravinsky, they played uh, these antiphonal choirs by uh, Gabriele and Schutz. Two brass choirs, so you know, and you think, well, you know, it's got to be in this room. That's just, that's it. When I got back to the States, this is the 1950s, I said, nah, I want a recording of Gabriele and Schutz, and I got it for, and it's in mono, so you get nothing of that. And I listen to it, it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyhow, good music has legs. It can survive being in a train station, in a piano showroom, in a concert hall. Does it concern you that so many concert goers these days are um, elderly? There's few, it's quite rare to see, you know, a bunch of young people in a classical music concert, isn't it? Well, it doesn't concern me because every time my music is played, the audience is usually predominantly young. So uh, I, I understand why people are worried about the, you know, the, the, the Haydn to Wagner uh, audience diminishing. But I think that we're seeing, and I think you're seeing certainly here in London when you go to the Barbican and you go to the South Bank, uh, a, a tremendously mixed audience. I mean, you see people my age, and I'm, I'm going to be 80, and, and you see, I, like I said, you see blue-haired ladies and you see blue-haired ladies. Mm -hmm. You hear the blue-haired ladies in their 80s and you see the punks. And that's as it should be. What is it about your music that managed to sort of transcend generations, do you think? I don't know, I just work here. <laughs> <laughs> you don't try and do it, it just happens. No, exactly. If you do try and do that, you fail. I mean, look, I think the answer is this. When I was a kid, uh, when I was uh, 14, the music that convinced me I really wanted to be spend my life in music was listening to the Rite of Spring, very quickly listening to the Fifth Brandenburg of Johann Sebastian Bach, and then Bebop, Charlie Parker, Miles Davis, and Henny Clark. In California, when I was a graduate student, at night I would go to hear John Coltrane. John Coltrane had a huge influence on me. I studied, uh, I went to Ghana to study uh, Ghanaian drumming. I studied Balinese gamelan. But the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that all those inputs are in what I do. So I'm the kid who's listening on the bar stool to Miles Davis when I'm 14. Cut to Queen Elizabeth Hall, right here in town. It's uh, early 70s. My ensemble's playing. At the end of the ensemble, a guy comes up, long hair, lipstick, says, how do you do on Brian Eno? And I think, poetic justice. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, different trains at its heart contrast your childhood memories of right. traveling by train in the States with the Holocaust trains. Right. When you look now at so many children wounded, killed, displaced in the refugee crisis, whether from Syria or parts of Africa, does that too, in your view, demand a, a musical response? Uh, when I started Different Trains, I was writing about myself. I really had no, uh, you know, um, phil philanthropic idea. I, I'm not a politically motivated composer. I, I but do. a lot of your pieces do have some kind of relevance to, you know, historical events, yes, political events. Yes, but they're all, but the, 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 and I'm being totally selfish here, mm. they're all things which really had to do with my life. I was just struck by the fact that for your birthday there's going to be 400 performances in 20 countries around the world. I was struck at that too. I mean, that's quite awe inspiring. I suppose it then occurred to me how much conflict and division there is across the world and that feeling of one man's music bringing together people across the globe. You don't see the power of that? I mean, do you, it's a good you too modest? It's a good story. Make sure you sprinkle a lot of sugar <laughs> on top. <laughs> You're too cynical. Steve Reich, thank you very much. My pleasure, thank you. Great. Tonight's main news, more chaos at the top of the independent inquiry into child sex abuse as a second lawyer reveals she's resigned. It came just hours after the senior counsel to the inquiry, Ben Emerson, was suspended. The Prime Minister has insisted that what she called a really important investigation into historic abuse allegations will still go ahead as planned. Much more on our Facebook page online, but that's all from us. We're back tomorrow night at 7. Until then, that's Channel 4 News. Have a great evening. Good evening.